the international network, network of basin organizations and i would like really to welcome you to to this uh, session of the european river symposium uh, together with our um, uh, partners from the icpdr and uh, unece uh, our session is dedicated to adaptation to climate change and the importance of uh, basin management and I will be your master of ceremony for this session. So I will start as usual with the housekeeping um, um, aspects of the sessions. Um, please um, rename yourself in a, uh, in a way that you can understand who you are with your name and the, uh, the name of your organization. Please keep your mic uh, on mute when you uh, do not uh, speak and uh, with the exception uh, when the moderator invites you to take the floor. You uh, um, can turn on or off your webcam depending on the quality of your uh, internet uh, connection. And if we have time, we will uh, be able to have a family picture at the end of the session with all the video uh, on. If you have questions, uh, including technical or thematic session, please use the chat box. Uh, and if you wish to ask the speakers or any uh, technical um, difficulty. And the uh, session is recorded. Well, that was it for me at the very beginning of the session. And as uh, the master of ceremony, it is now my pleasure to give the floor for his introduction um, speech to Mr. Timo Jokelainen. Uh, Timo is the Europe uh, INBO uh, president since uh, 2019, and he is also the chair of both the Finnish Swedish Transboundary River Commission and the Norwegian Finnish Commission on Transboundary Waters. Timo Jokelainen, the floor is yours. Thank you, Erika, and, and dear colleagues. It's my honor to have an opportunity to speak here today. Uh, in the beginning, I'd like to thank the organizer of this session. The team uh, adaptation to climate change is very important, and it seems the importance is just growing. As it is written in the context of this session, the climate change affects our societies by water cycle. We all are facing unpredictable weather conditions and so on. A basin organizations, both in national and transboundary levels, are showing us how to meet the challenge of the climate change. Today, in the keynote speech and in the case studies, we are hearing how the basin level cooperation and planning of water resources helps to improve adaptation. And dear friends, uh, I am coming from the northernmost Europe. From this perspective, those case studies coming across the Europe are interesting, and I hope you all find them in the same way. In my everyday work here in Finnish Lapland, uh, uh, focuses strongly on transboundary waters. In Finland, we have uh, four transboundary water commissions. Uh, as uh, Eric was saying before, with Norway, with Sweden, and also with Russia. In three of them, I am a chair, and in one, uh, I am a member. In those uh, commissions, we are daily working in uh, adaptation in the basin level. And the work is based on cooperation with our neighbor countries. Impacts of the climate change differ uh, in different regions. Here in the Arctic, they can't be the same than they in the southernmost Europe. But the reason behind is uh, this kind of exchanging of experiences, what we are doing today is the way to create a common understanding we all need in this new situation. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, as I happen to be Europe INBO president, I use this opportunity to inform you about the Europe INBO 2021 event that, that takes place on December 8th to December 10th. 
I hope you all save the date. Uh, the host country will be Malta. And in the event, the theme, what we are dealing with today, uh, will have a continuation. The climate change is transforming our environment. Uh, the change might differ, but everywhere we need to adapt our actions. In the adaptation, we need basin level cooperation. Today, in this session, we are hearing examples how to do it. I wish you all good session. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. President and dear Timo, and thank you for reminding us that we are all facing climate change impacts in, in all our different countries and, and climates. Just before giving the floor to our keynote speech, I have to announce that we will have a poll after um, the speech of uh, Mr. Zavatsky, so get ready um, to uh, answer these questions. But for now, uh, we uh, uh, are welcoming Mr. Ivan Zavatsky, Executive Secretary of the International Commission for the Protection of the Danube River, for the keynote speech of our session. Ivan, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, Eric. Uh, good afternoon to everybody, and thank you for inviting me to speak at this session. I will share my screen. Hope it will work. Uh, do you see it? Thank you. So uh, thank you very much. And I, in my short keynote, but still short intervention, I would like to share with you a few ideas and some practices how to answer to climate change adaptation in a large international river basin, what ICPDR, uh, what the, the new river basin is, utilizing EU-driven instruments like river basin management plan and flood risk management plan. And if you want to learn more about how this functions, these plans and international commissions, I'm making a short promo. The next session will be about the role of international commissions in river basin management planning. So stay with us longer. So to our topic. Oops. Yes. Very quickly about our basin. <clears throat> the New River Basin is famous for being the most international river basin in the world. Uh, 80 billion people call river basin its home. And what is important, the uh, 14 uh, countries sharing the basin plus the European Union are contracting parties to our convention. If we are a mixture of two types of countries. So we have um, nine EU members and five non-EU members but all of them are in certain relation with EU, either a, a associate members or, or candidate countries. So this is really a very mixed uh, mix group, but the basin is also very diverse, not only from hydrological or environmental point of view, also from social economic point of view, where we have rich member states like Austria, uh, Germany on the top, and less rich countries like Moldova or Ukraine on uh, at the lower part of the basin. Uh, important is that the backbone of our work is the convention signed in 1994 in Bulgaria, looking at all key aspects of water management except for navigation. navigation. So it's not only looking at the main stem, stem of the river at the entire basin, and this is really a legal instrument looking for sustainable use, protection, uh, reduction of pollutants, and ma manage flood and ice hazards. Uh, of course, the question is why we are only 14 countries, because at the beginning, the, the signatories uh, decided to invite only countries with territories larger than 2,000 square kilometers within the basin. However, every contracting party is ensuring that the objective of the convention and the river basin management planning happening also with the neighbors in, in the basin. Uh, Important is, before I got into more detail, to understand what ICPDR is working and how it is working. So ICPDR planning, whether river basin management or flood risk management, is not covering every detail of the issues of the basin. It's looking, and we are at operating at the part A, the roof level, on the issues where countries agree these are the uh, problems or these are the challenges and pressures which are only solvable at transnational level. Of course, our 
planning is uh, accompanied by the part B, which is a national river basin management plan or uh, international or sub basin international plans, and also part C, which are sub unit level defined as management units with national territory. Important is that these three levels needs to be coordinated vertically, and we ICPDR are responsible for the coordination horizontally at the roof level. And of course, our limitations are that we are looking only at the catchment areas larger than 4,000 square kilometers, lakes larger than 100 uh, square kilometers, and so on. So, as I said, the key, one of the key activities and the very strong vehicle for implementing of our convention is developing of these two plans. So the new river basin management plan is being developed under the guidance of water framework directive <clears throat> and flood risk management under the guidance of the floods directive. Important is that through these plans, we are able to use all the technical issues like, uh, like uh, looking at the pressures, looking assessment of these pressures, looking at uh, uh, developing environmental objectives and also designing program of measures to implement those objectives. So these are the key tools for us to work and to strengthen the cooperation and improve the ecological situation of the river. Uh, and how we are looking at it, as I said, from, from the scope perspective, we limit to these larger basins. From topic perspective, already at the first river basin management plan, we look a scientific look at our problems and we said, what are the key issues? So traditionally, until last year, it was only organic pollution, nutrient pollution, as other substances pollution and hydromorphological alterations. Uh, however, uh, about a year ago, the countries decided that the effects of climate change, uh, uh, droughts, water scarcity, extreme hydrological phenomena and their impacts are also important. So we opened the scope for the planning in the river basin management plan to this fifth issue. So it's a new identified issue which we are looking at. So how we are doing it, it's simply because, uh, as I said, we uh, tried to tackle this issue already in 2012. So in 2012, we developed the first uh, adaptation strategy for the entire basin, looking at the scientific uh, knowledge around us. So we didn't run any scientific model. Then we also consulted uh, broadly with, with, uh, with uh, stakeholders. And we are also offer, we were offering a a series of measures which countries are already implementing or planning to implement. Important is this is not a strategy per se with its own measures, own financing, but we are using for implementation of this strategy to these two plans. I will speak about it later. So also the minister, minister at our ministerial meeting, which is conducted every six years in 2016, asked us, while seeing the first adaptation strategy, to update it, to look in the new scientific results, look at the progress in the countries, look at the new measures which was to work. So, and then uh, incorporate this new knowledge into our, uh, our let's say, planning in both plans within the uh, EU driven cycle. So when we work on this type of cross-cutting issues like this, like this, uh, like this uh, adaptation strategy, we, uh, the commission, nominated three countries as a lead country to steer the process in and the, our river basin management expert group was uh, assigned as, as a leader in this process and of course all countries uh, have opportunity to, to nominate additional experts so the process was as i said first we look at the knowledge base and scientific divided scientific study so this was the first step second step we look at what we know and discuss it uh, in, a, in a workshop. So we invite stakeholders and, and, and the country representatives. Well, how do we understand these findings and where the problems are? And of course, uh, we discuss and put forward, based on the existing strategy, scientific uh, and scientific results, legislative and policy instruments, which are already in place. So we also assess, we are not going to reinvent the wheel, but look what the legislative and policy framework uh, uh, offer us for adaptation. And of course, this is all channeled through our working arms, which are our uh, expert and task groups. Uh, in 2018, based on the request from the ministers, we, did this, uh, we updated this strategy. So we again look at the new scientific results. What was the progress in the science? What we need more? What IPPC, uh, uh, 
IPCC panel is recommending to do about this. Secondly, we also look what implementation steps have been taken in the countries. And again, this <clears throat> uh, updated strategy is offering guidance on the integration of climate change into planning process. So again, we are not implementing strategy per se, we have a special tools for it. And of course, we always in our work promoting actions in a multilateral and transboundary context. So focusing on those type of problems, on those type of measures, which have this transboundary effect. And of course, this is also helping the countries as a reference document when they are developing the national strategies and uh, plans. In what type of measures we have, as I said, these are not the measures of being uh, obligatory or uh, enforceable from the uh, transboundary level, but we are offering a catalog of measures which countries are already implementing, which countries have, have been implemented, which plan to do. So this cross-fertilizing of understanding what are the best and most efficient way to address the, uh, to, to address the challenges of the clim uh, climate change with regard to adaptation. So we are looking at preparation measures, planning process, ecosystem-based measures, uh, behavioral and managerial measures, how to raise awareness and uh, what type of framework you need to do it. Also, we are offering uh, examples of technological measures to implement individual projects. And of course, we are looking at the policy approaches to support national and international basic by coordination of these activities. So, sorry, my, my screen is going to do something. Thank you. So, uh, as, 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 as we said, the Implementation is important that the, we, there is a joint understanding of the scenarios coming out of IPCC impacts and adaptation measures and how to share scientific knowledge base is essential. As I said, this strategy does not include a separate program of measures, but relevant actions proposed, recommended, identified in the strategy are incorporated in both plans. And this is going on every six years. And of course, is that there is a cross-cutting issue and all ICPDR expert and task groups were formally tasked by the commission, by the decision-making body to fully integrate this climate change adaptation in development of most plans. So it is even stronger than if the strategy per se will be uh, implemented itself. And of course, as we said, this strategy focused on relevant issues for the new basic level, on the level A, so we don't go into the national detail. And of course, it needs to be complemented with data planning on adaptation and sub-basic national and other levels. So it's the same approach as we have in our two, two plans. Yeah, actually it was in a nutshell. I hope I didn't uh, took so much of the time. If you have any questions to us, uh, to me, I will stay with you longer and uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ivan, for this. Um... A short but very interesting journey into a very uh, international um, context. So it's time now for um, for a poll and question and answers to um, to Ivan and, uh, and Timo. So do not hesitate to ask your questions uh, through the the chat, and I will um, speak uh, them out to the uh, to, to the speakers. But for now on, uh, you uh, see uh, on your on a screen um, uh, two questions, and so please. Uh, answer them. Question one is, do you have basin adaptation plans in your basin, yes or no? And what are the key measures of adaptation according um, to you? Alors, soft, maybe I have to uh, be more precise. Soft meaning governance, knowledge, or coordination of policies, this type of measures. Green meaning natural water retention measures, nature-based solutions like uh, wetland preservation, for example, and green meaning more traditional, so to speak, uh, infrastructures. Yeah, and it, it won't be open for, for long. <laughs> kind of a, of a teasing. So, Edouard, you will um, then tell me when uh, you, the, the results are stabilized. And then it will be interesting, I think, to, to get the reactions uh, from both um, Ivan and Timo. I, since I don't see any other uh, question through the chat now. 
So can we see the results? So the answer is to um, um, question one, do you have basin adaptation plans in your basins? Yes, for 70%. What are the key measures of adaptation according to you? Green uh, gets the majority, 57%. Uh, then soft measures, 27%, and then gray measures. So Ivan, Timo, any, any comment or reaction to the, uh, the, these uh, results? Uh Okay, uh, Eric, if I start just shortly, uh, I think it's, uh, I'm very pleased to see that those uh, basin adaptation takes place, place in, in, in basins everywhere around Europe. And, and, and uh, as I told in my introduction, I think it's a way to handle the situation in, in the basin, basin level. But from that point of view, also uh, it's very interesting or important to see that those basins are so different uh, as we have heard already here in this session. session. And this uh, second question, uh, I'm not uh, totally sure if uh, we have answered uh, similarly uh, on the question. It's quite uh, difficult and depends about what kind of measures we are thinking. Thinking and those, uh, and, and at least from my point of view, I wanted to uh, uh, put my uh, note in uh, more than one um, places there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Timo. And for the, um, the answer to the first session, if I can complement, at the international level, our estimation, we, we don't have a very exact or precise or, or, or com completely confirmed result, but we would say that only the, the half of basin organizations uh, already have um, done this exercise of, uh, of designing an adaptation plan. So uh, without too much surprise, we can see here that the, the European uh, basins are in advance compared to what, what is happening at the, at, the, at the more global scale. Ivan? Uh, very quickly, I will just would share uh, Timo's uh, comment on the second question that I was also hesitating to click on the more than one because uh, that's, but okay, this is the, the role of the ball. Uh, this, is the, this, is, this is the rule of the game. However, I'm also pleased to see that most of you answer that green uh, measures are, you are, uh, are relevant for participants. I think it's, it's a very good sign that we river basin managers, river basin people are thinking in a, in a proper way forward to make sure that whatever we do to adaptation is fully in line with the uh, objectives of this conference, let's put it this way, yeah, to save our rivers, not to, not to lock them in a, in a, in a uh, concrete channel. Uh, and uh, with regard to the first question, yes, I again agree with Timo, but my quick reaction would be that actually, yes and no, that it's, I think there are two approaches which can be used for this and we have to learn from each other. Either something like top down that the International Commission is putting together a rather general strategy like we have and then countries are picking up measures, picking up policies from there to beef up their national plans or like, any, like other activities, countries are working on their national adaptation plans on the uh, national river basin management plan, adaptation plan, and then at the level of the International Commission, we could stick heads together and put something which is relevant for the whole basin. And I, and I honestly speaking, I have no preference which approach is better, and I think it's very much relevant on the specific international basin. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for these um, further comments. And yes, we know that the the, the the knowledge, the data, the scientific models, as you have uh, uh, mentioned already, um, even in your in your speech, are not always easy to to design, to build on, since they are not available at all the uh, the, the scales that we would like, where we would like to have them. And so this this is an important uh, factor of uncertainty uh, when it's time to, um, to 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 design adaptation plans and to to choose. Uh, measures. 
Well, thank you very much to both of you, and thank you very much for to the audience for answering the poll. It's a time now for um, the presentation of our case studies and to exchange. And to do that, I'm happy to give the floor to our moderator, moderator for this uh, um, um, part of our session. So I'll, I'm giving the floor to Mrs. Hanna Plotnikova, Environmental Affairs Officer at the United Nations Economic Commission for Europe. Anna, the floor is yours for uh, the moderation of this uh, part of the session. Hello, dear colleagues. I hope uh, you can hear and see me well. Uh, thanks so a lot, Eric, for the introduction. And as mentioned, I'm coming from the Secretariat uh, of the Convention on the Protection and Use of uh, Transboundary Water Courses and International lakes, uh, so-called the Water Convention. And um, I'm very delighted to be invited uh, by INBO and ICPDR to, to be a partner for this session and also to uh, moderate it. Uh, I would like uh, just briefly to start uh, uh, that as um, we know, climate change recognizes no borders. And in this uh, case, actually, the framework of the Water Convention uh, uh, provides uh, a very good, uh, uh, unique, uh, legal and uh, global intergovernmental uh, basis for transboundary cooperation in climate change adaptation, including flood and drought management. And therefore, this session is uh, very close to my heart, uh, both uh, personally and uh, professionally. <clears throat> Unfortunately, I uh, would need to keep uh, the timing. Uh, everybody from the panelists will have eight minutes. And uh, I was tasked uh, by the organizers to uh, remind you when you have uh, two minutes uh, left. So apologies in advance for interruptions <laughs> from my side. And uh, um, I would like uh, now to uh, go to, to the panel. And um, actually, I would like to invite uh, uh, first uh, uh, Mrs. Uh, Francois Goulard uh, from the uh, Adur Garonne Water Agency. Uh, Adur Garonne Water Agency, together with uh, their basin uh, committee, developed uh, the climate change adaptation plan. And uh, we would like uh, to hear from uh, you, Mrs. Goulard. Uh, what uh, your climate change adaptation uh, plan is about and what uh, it includes. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Hannah. Uh, is it okay for the sound? Yeah, okay, great. So let me see. Do you see my PPT presentation? Yes, great. <laughs> okay, good morning, everybody. Um, first of all, let me see. Uh -huh. Well, I can't have the other slide, sorry. If you uh, want, let me uh, see why. If you want, we can help with that. We have someone ready to share a screen for you. Okay. I try again. Oui. Okay. Yes. Let me uh, present you the um, quickly the Adour Garonne Basin. We are located in the southwest of France, uh, including two big cities. You know, of course, Bordeaux near the Atlantic Ocean and Toulouse, not far away from the Pyrenees mountain. Um, but except a few municipalities, that's a very rural area uh, with less than 8 million inhabitants. In the southwest of France, climate change is already a reality. Since the 60s, uh, air temperature has increased by one, more than one Celsius degree and projection to 2050 indicate an increase of 1.5 to 2.8 Celsius degree, especially during summer 
and fall. This air temperature increase uh, has major hydrological consequences. That means more humidity in the atmosphere and a change of precipitation patterns. An average, of, an average air temperature increase of two degrees means an important snowfall reduction and an increase uh, in evapotranspiration. The direct consequences of those phenomena include less water for infiltration and less water for flow. We can expect between a 20 to 40% of average flow reduction and some earlier, um, more severe and longer low water flow periods. In reaction to that, um, the Adour Garonne Water Agency and its Basin Committee have established an adaptation plan. Um, the Basin Committee has created a specific working group of eight, uh, eight people, including experts, but also states and regional services, um, in order to ensure coherence between all the planning documents. It took us 18 months uh, with a consultation phase, and the vote was in uh, July 2018. First of all, it was important to share the scientific diagnosis. Then we made some vulnerability maps uh, to explain what would the Bassin situation be with the climate of tomorrow. As you see on the PPT, there is some uh, gray and pink area. Uh, pink means very severe vulnerability. And those maps explain uh, the question of scarcity. At last, a panel of measures was listed to reduce vulnerability. Um, our action plan includes hundreds of measures uh, sorted in three categories, like we said before, the soft, the green, and the gray ones. And I uh, will get back later with the example. Our action plan includes seven axes. First, realizing that taking action is a necessity. Then, then ensuring adaptive governance. Our third chapter is integrating water issue into uh, land planning, land use planning. Next, we focus on building on nature and enhancing ecosystem resilience. The fifth axis consists in reinforcing economical development that is less polluting and less consuming. Then we develop uh, how to secure resources and ensure protection with infrastructures. And uh, last but not least, we include one chapter on knowledge and innovation. Adaptation to climate change is for us not only not just adjusting what we are already doing. We need deep transformation with the mix of uh, three categories of measures and for us, I think the most important is a soft one. Governance, knowledge, education, practices, change, um, but also green measures based on nature, such as uh, wetland preservation, agroecology development. These kind of measures has many benefits, uh, helping with adaptation, of course, but also with mitigation and uh, biodiversity preservation. And finally, some uh, gray measures based on infrastructure and technology, um, such as uh, water treatment plants or water storage. After the plant, our job is to fund with subsidies, municipalities and economical actors to apply adaptation measures. For instance, last year, 
we spend more than 160 million euros uh, to do what? Well, I give you some example to dewaterproof, to preserve wetland and hedges, to create local water governance, to promote natural flood expansion areas, to reduce linkage in the pipes, well, uh, to promote uh, ecological continuity or to support the low water level with water from hydroelectric uh, reserve, to develop agroecological uh, uh, practices and so on and so on. Well, I think with those different examples, I arrive at the end of my presentation to be sure to be in, in eight minutes. So thank you for your attention. Thank you a lot for your great uh, presentation and also for being even uh, before and then on time. And uh, I would like uh, also to say that it's really fascinating how many sectors uh, you managed to involve and uh, how many different uh, measures of different types you managed to uh, develop. And in fact, uh, this participatory approach uh, proved uh, to be effective in developing adaptation strategies and uh, plans. So thanks a lot. And I would like to remind the participants so that the chat is open for questions. You can put your questions uh, there and uh, after the panel, we will try to answer them. Uh, so now I would like uh, to move uh, actually to the other basin, namely the Rhine uh, basin, where a lot of uh, coordination between the riparian countries is uh, performed by the International Commission for the Protection of the Rhine. And I would like to give uh, the floor to Mrs. Nicola schulte kellinghaus uh, from this commission and uh, to ask you to inform us how actually you are adapting to climate change in your basin with the uh, different riparians. Thank you, Hannah. And um, hello, everybody. I will share my screen with you. So here we go, hopefully. Um, yeah, good afternoon, dear colleagues. And I'm happy to be here at the European River Symposium with you today. It's a good opportunity for exchange also for me as scientific employee of the Rhine Commission. Thanks for inviting me to talk about uh, the climate change adaptation and in particular about the low water monitoring in the Rhine River Basin. Probably the most of you know about um, the location of the River Rhine, a river in Western Europe within a densely populated and highly industrialized area. Extensive knowledge exists for the Rhine River Basin on the effects of climate change on discharge and the development of water temperature. Based on climate projections, gauze related simulations for the water regime and the water temperature in the Rhine River Basin were developed for the near and the remote future. Let me shortly describe how our commission works before I come to the low water monitoring. We, the ICPR, look back on 70 years of international cooperation. The Convention on the Protection of the Rhine, an international treaty, is a legal basis of our commission. The ICPR is a coordination-based commission, so the whole implementation of measures and measurements are realized by the member states themselves. The states send their national experts to our expert groups, for example, the expert group Low Water. When the delegates come together, the common goals are defined. And along with European legislation applying to the EU member states, decisions are taken in common consents. In our secretariat and Copelands, we are 10 employees working on the issues of ecology, water quality, flooding and low water and climate change adaptation with our three working languages, German, French and Dutch. I would like to go on by illustrating with these four pictures the challenges related to climate change in the Rhine River Basin. 
According to studies, by the middle of the 21st centuries, up to 20% higher discharges are expected during winters in the Rhine catchment and up to 10% lower discharges are expected during summers, while regional variations may occur. Thus, the effects of climate change modify the discharge pattern of the Rhine and its tributaries. Likely, periods with floods or low water or heavy rain will become more frequent and more distinct. A rise in air temperatures leads to higher water temperatures, which again, together with low flow, might result in an ecological and chemical modification of water bodies. Last year, we have drawn a balance of our Rhine 2020 program, which also includes measures of climate change adaptation. An example, 140 square kilometers of floodplains have been restored in the last 20 years. More room for the river is good for nature and for flood protection along downstream river sections. The target was slightly missed, but still a success. Another 200 square kilometers of floodplain shall be restored by 2040. Our vision is a green ribbon of natural areas accompanying the Rhine, providing habitat for numerous hydrophilic species and mitigating the effects of climate change. In addition, in the last 20 years, 124 lateral waters have been reconnected to the mainstream of the Rhine as important refugium for species during droughts. The target of 100 was well exceeded. Another 100 oxbow lakes shall be reconnected by 2040. Our vision is the recovery of stocks of many fish species migrating in fresh water, seeking adjoint bodies for waters for sporing. Three years ago, a major low flow event hit the Rhine with massive problems for navigation. Together with our neighbor commissions, we have published a low water monitoring system for the rivers Rhine, Moselle and Meuse, which classifies low water events according to their intensity. To illustrate the intensity, the states have agreed on a five stage classification. You can find our uniform um, Rhine-wide low mo water monitoring on our website, and it is also linked to the Undine portal of the BFG, the German Federal Institute of Hydrology. It, it allows to directly compare and classify low water events and to detect changes in low water discharge. We also have initiated a cooperation with the European Trout Observatory, the Joint Research Center for the European Commission. In addition, knowledge of the effects of climate change on biocenosis and river ecosystems needs to be further developed through studies and monitoring. Coming to my last slide. In February 2020, our new program, Rhine 2040, Sustainably Managed and Climate Resilient, was adopted by the Rhine Ministerial Conference in Amsterdam. One of our next steps will be to update our climate change adaptation strategy until 2025 in cooperation with important user groups. In addition to new data and projections, we will also have a closer look on socioeconomic trends. For example, thinking about the shutdown of nuclear power plants versus the development of larger sh ships making our sh uh, system more vulnerable. I'm sure about two things. First, there are and will always be uncertainties, but we believe that the trends are robust enough to act. Second, we have learned that it's important to build on existing approaches of river restoration and flood and low water management in the countries, as in our case, it is them who implement and finance measures, so acceptance is crucial. Thanks, the audience, for your interest, and I'm looking for the discussion. Thanks a lot, Nicola, for your great uh, intervention. And uh, indeed, it is uh, very uh, um, enthusiastic to hear that uh, you are going to update your climate change uh, adaptation strategy, as well as that uh, you are including uh, different measures like low water monitoring, nature-based solutions, uh, 
Yeah, and considering the uh, uh, impacts of different uh, sectors, uh, and uh, this really proves that climate change is kind of uniting uh, different sectors and different stakeholders. I would like also to um, briefly thank you to the um, uh, International Rhine, uh, International Commission for the Protection of Rhine for your cooperation uh, with the Water Convention. And uh, moving forward, uh, I would like uh, to, uh, to move actually to Spain and uh, to give uh, the floor now to Mr. Fernanda Magdaleno from the Ministry of Ecological Transition and uh, Demographic uh, Challenge. It is a good uh, uh, continuation of uh, the intervention from uh, Nicola because Spain has very good experience in uh, river restoration and uh, very recent experience in uh, at the Ebro Resilience Project. And we are very uh, keen to hear from you, Fernanda, what this project uh, is about and uh, what recent uh, lessons learned you achieved through this project. Uh, the floor is yours. And again, I'm reminding about the possibility to ask questions in the chat. Thank you so much, Hannah. Thank you so much, organizers, for inviting me here today. And I will be sharing one case study from one of the major, uh, bigger projects in Spain, which tries to adapt to climate change, to the different risks we are facing uh, involving climate issues, flood risk issues, and also all the questions related to biodiversity and uh, the more environmental aspects of river management. This uh, project is uh, located in northeast Spain. You know, it's uh, one of the biggest the basin in the country, which is in the South Pyrenees. And this is a, a big valley, which is uh, historically associated to floodplain and to cropping areas. But it has been facing for many decades already uh, some big challenges related to, to flood risks, with some um, quite negative uh, images like that in the, in the upper side of the slide. But also, it's, uh, it's sustaining uh, important habitats for conservation. And also, it's uh, one area which is increasing interest for people regarding recreational issues and all kinds of leisure and sportive uh, aspects like kayaking and other sportive aspects uh, of, uh, of river uh, use. So uh, it combines many different aspects. And uh, to try to cope with adaptation uh, things and the floodplain uh, management, a big project has been initiated in 2017, which will be lasting for 10 years with the overall budget of over 100 million. And this uh, funding is going to be based on different sources from the national, the regional, and the local uh, levels of administration, and with the participation of the Basin Agency and of the Ministry of Environment, which I represent here today. The main target of the project is to, to combine the uh, different objectives of the three uh, main directives uh, today for river management, which are the WFD, the flood risk directive, and the habitats directive. So we try to minimize different risks and try to improve the beneficial aspects of, of floodings in, in the area, trying to improve a uh, space for the river to apply different NWRM and nature-based solutions. So, <clears throat> To, uh, trying to improve the river ecological integrity and the hydromorphological and ecological aspects of that integrity, and also to promote those habitats which are more endangered and which are more vulnerable to climate scenarios and to different uh, negative aspects related to uh, river uses in the area. The floodplain of the Ebro River uh, is sustaining a wide array of uh, territory habitats, and I, on, I only list here, summarize some of the <coughs> sorry most relevant ones. So it includes uh, habitat related to, to rivers, to wetlands, and also to drilling areas. So it's quite of a mosaic of habitats, and uh, it really has uh, importance at the national and the regional uh, levels. The project was uh, designed on the basis of different uh, preliminary assessments uh, regarding especially which were the current level of floodplain defenses in the area. This uh, site which has been for decades uh, covered with a big number 
or different levees, uh, walls, groins, roads. So it's uh, almost a cascade of uh, today of uh, lateral defenses and, and all kind of protection works. So the main uh, axis of the river, uh, which includes over 250 kilometers and some of the main tributaries of the river were uh, at the very beginning of the project almost covered with all this kind of, of uh, works, which were part of the political uh, management of the basin for many decades, and which involved also dredging of sediments and the typical uh, old traditional uh, practices devoted to floodplain management. So we uh, conducted this inventory, uh, which uh, brought us a big list of, of different obstacles for, for flow, sediment, and nutrient and, and biotic factors. And we also uh, conducted and carried out different hymo and ecological analysis, including the coupling of topographic and bathymetric uh, analysis and many different ecological assessments to understand very well which was the present, the current dynamics of the, of the floodplain and different habitats uh, sustained by, by it. Also, a quite uh, detailed uh, modeling was performed, uh, including bidimensional modeling for hydraulic, uh, hydrology, geomorphological, and ecological aspects, try to understand which were the hot spots uh, and which, uh, which were the main challenges and the main opportunities we were uh, having in the area, trying to select those which were uh, more prone to, to action. On the basis uh, of all those different assessments, uh, a big number of a big set of measures were uh, listed, were designed, including flood risk management measures and river restoration measures. Uh, for instance, as you can see listed in this table, prevention measures like maintaining river beds, permeabilizing different uh, river areas, uh, improving land planning, also protection measures, like trying to protect those areas which were more consolidated from the urban perspective, optimizing the current defense works, introducing bypass channels in the, in the towns, or uh, there were also preparation measures trying to improve HIMO uh, information protocols of communication to people in those cases where, where uh, floodings were occurring in the area, and also different recovery measures after the, the happening of those uh, flooding. But from the perspective of rehabilitation and restoration of the river, there were a wide number also of, of different actions, including a connectivity of uh, all meanders, of uh, secondary arms, all kinds of different territorial elements which could be providing a space and, and a good working to the river. And also there were some measures which were more related to biodiversity to try to improve, as I was saying before, those sites of the river valley which were especially sustaining the, the most vulnerable and more uh, valuable species or habitats in the whole uh, valley. The project was, uh, since this is a very, very long area, as I was saying, with over 200 kilometers uh, from La Rioja to uh, Catalonia, uh, regions in Spain, uh, it was uh, segmented, sectorized into 15 different uh, uh, segments of the river, which had a more similar a high mode dynamics with more similar pressures and impacts and which could be um, answering, replying to our measures in a more homogeneous way. So it was quite a uh, order in this uh, way with those 15 different uh, sub segments of the valley. And just to finish with the presentation, some examples of the things which have already been done, because as I was saying before, this is an ongoing project, which is, is just a life project and it needs to be uh, bringing into action the new knowledge we can have from the hydro B responses and from the experience uh, uh, raised from the already developed measures. So some of the uh, some of those which were already uh, executed, like this, which includes reopening arms in uh, some sites where there were some uh, critical uh, places for flooding, and you can see the result. Uh, during the execution of the works and after one of the floodings. But also there were other things like you can see here, the removal of levees and permeabilization of different road facilities to allow water in under those circumstances to, to move more freely along the floodplain and to avoid uh, bottlenecks, which could be inducing, enhancing high risk uh, in, the nearby in the nearby towns. 
some other images from the from the machinery you're working, uh, deleting different levies or relocating those which uh, still had to protect some specific uh, uh, issues in the valley, and uh, some other images from different uh, sites and provinces uh, in the whole valley. One major uh, example was uh, designed and executed in the uh, in the confluence in the junction of the two tributaries Arga and Aragon River through a very detailed diachronic analysis of geomorphology and a quite detailed also uh, hydraulic and hydrologic modeling and this involved reopening the old meanders which were disconnected uh, due to different uh, river cuts and different dredgings in the past and which has allowed to reopen much the space and to give that uh, widening which is necessary to avoid incision to let sediments flow more freely and to avoid that the, uh, uh, the nearby towns can be affected by those severe flooding and also this included uh, constructed wetlands and taking some uh, non-compatible uses out of the space given or uh, recovered by by the river and finally it has been complemented with some ongoing uh, works for communication and trying to provide, as you can see here, some guidelines which can make different water users, water uh, uses in the in the valley, more uh, sensitive to how they can cope with flooding. So we are providing these uh, adapted uh, guidelines uh, which explain them how uh, climate change can be uh, enhancing new risk to their uses and how they can adapt from different perspective to that uh, uh, potentially negative uh, sites of, of flooding. All this information is, uh, you can uh, download it from the different uh, networks, from Facebook, Instagram, or, or YouTube. So you can download any material, video, this is all published. So there is a, a quite wide participatory uh, public uh, channel going on to let people know what we are doing and trying to communicate better this change of paradigm in river management in our country. And my final slide is uh, to show you that this is one ongoing project, but which is part of one ongoing strategy for river restoration in Spain with over 50 different projects. Maybe the Ebro example is the biggest in dimension and significance, but there are many others which involve deleting uh, barriers, reopening uh, river space and many other things. So you're invited at any time to ask me for any additional information to discuss what we are doing, to learn from each other and to change our experience in these kind of issues. Thank you very much. And I'll, open to, I'll be open to any question in the chat or afterwards. Thanks. Thank you a lot, uh, Fernando, for this uh, great presentation, especially with there are so many practical examples, uh, which uh, I'm sure are good to learn more. And maybe there will be additional questions, or we can also look through the uh, guidance materials uh, you shared. Uh, thanks a lot. And uh, um, I would like uh, now to um, uh, move again to the river basin organization, uh, namely to the International Skelt uh, Commission. Uh, it is uh, also very much involved uh, in uh, transboundary climate change adaptation, including uh, flood and drought uh, management. And within this, uh, I would like uh, to invite Mr. Leon Daene, uh, who is the Secretary General of uh, the International Skelt uh, Commission. And uh, we actually would like to hear from you, Leon, uh, what is the biggest uh, uh, challenge uh, for um, uh, climate change adaptation in, uh, in your basin, which you are facing? Yes, um, thank you very much, uh, Hannah. And uh, I'm uh, delighted to be here at the um, uh, symposium. Um, let me try to share with you the presentation. Uh, here we are. Uh, can you see it all? Is that okay? Yeah, perfect. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> it may seem a contradiction, uh, but in the future, in the near future even, periods of extreme drought will go hand in hand with periods of abundant rains, possibly leading to flooding. Add to that the rise in sea level due to climate change, the increased average temperatures due to 
an increased level of CO2 in the atmosphere, and the complex set of challenges will present itself in the Skelt uh, District. The Skelt District covers all natural and artificial uh, surface waters, groundwaters, and coastal waters of the Skeld region, going from the summer in France, in its southwest uh, part, to the Oosterschelde and the Grevelingenmeer in the northeast uh, of the district in the Netherlands, and is uh, directly responsible for the coordination of the efforts to meet the objectives of the EU Water Directive and the EU Flood Directive. As such, the International Scout Commission is directly responsible for all aspects related to the quantity and the quality of water of about 15 million citizens. With its dense population, uh, its considerable and old industrial and urban uh, structure, inclusive many polluted sites, its exposure to the sea, um, its dramatic floodings in the past coming from the sea into these low countries, and its extreme percentage of paved surface, making that pluvial waters are very quickly evalu evacuated into the sea. The Skelt district may be one of the smallest river basins, but is probably uh, one of the uh, more challenging. All those elements make that droughts and floods have and will even have more in the future devastating impact on the entire district. Uh, droughts are essentially a consequence of climate change, increasing temperature, fewer rainy days and higher temperature peaks. Floods are caused by heavy rainfall, sea floodings or pluvial floods. All of those elements in combination with the low countries and, as I've mentioned before, the human uh, factors. Already today, the experts agree that the Skell District is to be considered the uh, Sahara of uh, Europe. And here you see two sources of information in that respect. Yet, uh, water and rivers play an important role in an ecosystem. Geographies, with an efficient water management and water ground reserves have a more balanced vegetation, keeping the water balance in order, managing CO2 level and impacting average temperatures, and also have more wetlands, again, taking CO2 out of the air. As uh, Hannah mentioned, an ecosystem does not follow national borders, nor is it a homogeneous entity uh, at the level of a uh, continent like Europe, let alone at the global level. Um, but while the effects of climate change have global consequences, the measures to combat them uh, will only be effective if they can be applied at a lower level. Uh, an ecosystem is largely formed and dominated by its major uh, river, like we saw before for the Danube and the Rhine. More and more experts, therefore, are of the opinion that such a level to implement those measures is most effective at a river basin uh, level. Um, <clears throat> the lower parts of uh, the Skelt District District, and here you see the map of the potentially significant risk of flooding. So the lower parts of the Skel district, essentially Belgium and the Netherlands, are very vulnerable to uh, floodings. Therefore, in our management plan, um, it's, it's essential to have those management plans in place. Uh, we have three uh, key objectives. First, the coordination of all measures related to floods. Second, exchange of information between the regions. And third, the exchange of knowledge. What we have done so far was exchanging information on forecasts so that we can better put preventive measures in place, uh, exchanging low water notices, uh, to take the necessary measures also on the spot and knowledge exchange through uh, workshops. And for our next planning uh, period in 2020-2027, 
The SCALD uh, district has developed the three P strategy, prevention, protection, and preparedness. And that three P strategy is a combination of a set of uh, green measures, benefiting from the eco services delivered by an efficient water management, uh, blue measures, something we added, uh, and blue measures is somewhere in between, whereby man helps out the ecosystem to regain its equilibrium. But as of that spot, let the ecosystem uh, develop itself. A set of gray measures, which are purely based on interventionist policies, like building dams against flooding, for instance. And I added a set of red measures, nothing to do with water, nor ecosystems, nor human intervention, but purely exchanging information and compensating for potential losses if we turn uh, land into uh, wetland, for instance. Now, the challenge in the Skell district, like in probably a number of other uh, districts, Besides investing in and implementing the appropriate measures on time, of course, is to reconcile two very different visions, which are virtually opposite visions. The functional vision versus the traditional vision on environmental protection. The first vision gives back the ecosystem to the ecosystem what the human history has taken from it and benefits from the services the river gives back to its population. The second view is interventionists and protects human beings in the first place. The cost of realizing both visions is high. The interventionist vision provides rapid and substantial realizations and thus becomes quickly visible to citizens. Dams, widening of rivers, strengthening of river banks, evacuation channels, etc. The eco-services vision, however, is more sustainable, but will only show its first timid benefits after a few years. So therefore, in conclusion, a couple of focus points. First, there is no unanimity in our district in our group of experts, even on the long-term climate change scenarios, 2050, 2100, especially related to floods. Uh, this discussion between, uh, do we prepare for a rise of the sea level of 60 centimeters up to, do we take all consequences in, in mind? Uh, the 1000 year storm, uh, high floods, uh, etc., and then come to potentially having to prepare in certain areas up to nine meters of increase. That's a big, big difference. Um, many aspects also of the interaction between global warming and water are still unknown. Um, we now find the first quantitative data on the effects of opening closed rivers in cities on the average temperature, for instance. Um, as I've mentioned, we have different visions and approaches which we need to reconcile. Uh, we also have the fact that we are faced to long term consequences on impact and on measures versus short term policies. And uh, finally, the direct consequences of drought are already visible, for instance, subsidence of buildings due to a falling groundwater level but the measures do not bring an immediate uh, remediation. So those are the points amongst a couple of others we we'll need to focus on. I'll gladly take uh, your questions afterwards. Many thanks for your attention. Thanks a lot, uh, uh, Leon, for a uh, very good uh, presentation and uh, bringing this issue of managing floods and droughts uh, together and uh, actually uh, we are now um, 
coming to, to the discussion and to the questions. We have for, for now three questions and uh, uh, every speaker is uh, welcome to uh, answer them. Actually, the first uh, question came from uh, Eric Tartu and uh, um, uh, it sounds like this. Uh, we don't have the same legal frameworks for flood management, flood management on the one hand, uh, for example, flood directive, national policies, drought management. Uh, on the other hand, uh, which requires more local approaches, um, and uh, is it challenging to address uh, both for floods and uh, droughts, and how could uh, that be improved if necessary? Actually, this question is open to all speakers. I understand that Ivan Zavatsky wanted to address it. So maybe one, uh, the first, uh, the floor is yours and then uh, everybody else is welcome as well. Uh, thank you, Hanna. And I will be very brief. It's not totally direct answer about this, but I want to point to one issue on this uh, different policy framework where the national policies are very much uh, referring to the local needs and the local conditions for water management. And I'm using the example of the irrigation because for example, in the lower Danube basin, the, uh, the uh, uh, production of uh, different uh, crops like uh, corn and soya and wheat is critical for the uh, economic survival of the agriculture sector there. And I'm really, I was astonished and find it very interesting that how a uh, top science, I'm speaking about the uh, remote sensing on a large global scale using the, the power of this uh, multi-power computers, this, 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 uh, this uh, type of uh, scientific approach in comparison with measuring the evapotranspiration and, and looking at the, at the land cover, specifically on these three crops, you can easily uh, uh, get to, the, to, to find out a correlation between evapotranspiration and the, and the yields uh, from these fields with regard to the tons per hectare or oil per hectare. So in principle, by management, looking at the river as a source of irrigation water and the evapotranspiration and the economic result of that farmer, you can easily find a correlation between how you can e either to inc increase the yield or keep the same yield with, let's say, different crops, because the different crops in summer period during the irrigation time have different evapot evapotranspiration effect. So why to irrigate so much, like we see today, why to use so much of venue water or other venue uh, tributary waters for irrigation of the, of the fields to get lower yields in the crop if you can change the crop and using a different one with a uh, same economic or, or, or yield. So th this type of, let's say, scientific approach can influence the local policies in a way which can help the countries to address the drought issue coming from the climate change, for example, for the Southern River Basin, uh, the Danube River Basin is a really critical issue. Thank you. Thank you a lot, Ivan, for your answer. And uh, we still have a couple of minutes for this uh, question. So if uh, somebody else uh, from the speakers would like to answer, please go ahead. Uh, Leon, did you want to also to address this question? Yeah, effectively, the question of aligning policies is a very hard one. Uh, at river basin level, the only thing we can do is ensure through our coordination that measures taken in a part of the district are not to the detriment of measures taken in another part of the district. And, and as such, that's very important. Um, for, the, for the rest, we can make nice plans, uh, but if you have a major pollution in your district, like we had in April 2020, the work of 10 years is gone. Um, and you have to start over again and, and rebuild parts of your river. Uh, so 
those are effectively true three and then the last threat to to the to the policies is like i've mentioned the fact that those measures have to be taken in parliament parliament consists of politicians who have a four-year vision that's to the next election and the measures we need to take are measures who have a vision of 10 20 50 years it does not really match so there's a, a big awareness we need to build we need to hope for little catastrophes to happen so that we can foster that uh, awareness uh, not just for politicians but also in society to citizens in uh, general thank you a lot uh, Leon, uh, for for your answer and uh, actually we have uh, one more question uh, which was raised by philip uh, uh, weller and um, uh, it sounds like this. Are there good examples where local water utilities like water supply services have been helpful leading or supporting uh, the river basin efforts uh, to create climate resilient measures? And I already aware that Fernando had an answer for this question. So please give us your perspective, Fernando. Yes, thank you, Hannah. I would like to combine maybe both questions into my answer, uh, because I think that the alienation of different uh, policies is essential, of course. We need to alienate or to bring together the flat policies with the drought policies and with the different land use policies. In, in fact, in Spain, we have the flat plans, which are uh, completely committing the European uh, orientations. And we also have the drought plans, which are a national tool to try to cope with the challenges brought by, by droughts. But any of those will have any sense if we don't spend uh, time, energy, and much effort to let people understand which is the benefit from bringing all of this, all this together. So in our case, only when farmers, when, only when urban people understood that the traditional tools were not function, functioning well anymore, they were uh, opening the mind to shifting policies and to combine biodiversity, flood risk uh, policies, drought, land use, and uh, many others. So my main message is that we have to spend much time, much energy, much political uh, stimulation to make people change their mind, to understand, to, to, to better uh, being aware of what brings the change, the shift in the uh, traditional policies which were been implemented in the floodplain. So uh, only then we had the support of farmers and many of them are already uh, supporting the, the, the works we are, we are hitting. So we need those people. We really must base our interventions on those water users and we have to explain very much what we learn from the uh, good and uh, bad part of our new uh, approach to the, to the land. Thanks a lot, uh, Fernando. And I see that there is some discussion already in going in the chat. And uh, for these particular questions, uh, would anybody of the speakers uh, like to add something? Maybe I, I can give some example of, of back my, my, my uh, perspective. You know, more and more often, that's the same level of action, the municipality. We have the, um, the water supply services and the plant treatment plants, but also uh, they are interesting by preservation of wetlands or um, river restoration. So that means that we can build with us, with them, um, a global plan and help uh, them with uh, subsidies if the plan is coherent uh, and mix all the different kind of measures. So it could be a, a, a solution um, to, to work with them at a local level. Thanks a lot. Uh, indeed, uh, it's uh, an, um, very important to work on different levels, including the local one. And I see a hand from uh, Len. Go ahead. Yes, um, 
in, in the question here, at what level are we the most effective, local, national, European? Um, well, I think the local level is a very important level. If I look at uh, the Sigma plan in Flanders, uh, which made land available uh, to the river in case of flooding, um, there was a lot of public resistance in the beginning in certain areas. So you need to have the appropriate buy-in in local level. <clears throat> National level is not very efficient. As, as we saw in all the uh, presentations, no single river basin corresponds with national borders but it's unfortunately the level where the money is and where the investments are to be decided. So you need to have that one on board too. And a larger level, European level or a level of cooperation between river basins is a very appropriate level to do um, uh, certain investments. Uh, for instance, together with the Meuse uh, district, we are developing a joint um, warning and alert system. Um, I can imagine that in order to benefit from the new technology which is available since a couple of decades, think about uh, all the satellites which are moving around, which could help us detecting pollutions, for instance, you need to have a European level because we are talking here of an investment which will go somewhere between 80 to 120 million euros. And it can benefit all of the river basins, uh, even beyond the European Union. So to some extent, you need the three levels. And that is why we need to foster the cooperation uh, between the levels and the river basins to make sure that we can move ahead because the challenges are very big. Um, and 2027 is a deadline for the uh, water directive, uh, framework water directive. And um, a lot of governments are working hard to make sure that they can pick up the last pieces. Uh, we can only hope and pray and work hard to make sure that in the meantime, any accidental pollution does not cross those uh, plans and measures. Thank you a lot, uh, uh, Leon, for uh, your intervention and additions. Uh, in fact, uh, we are uh, coming close uh, to the conclusions, but we still have a couple of more minutes. And there was uh, one more question in the chat, uh, again, related to, to how we uh, facilitate commitment uh, from local and regional governments uh, for climate change adaptation actions. So if uh, there are some more interventions or reactions from the panelists, please uh, feel free to take the floor. Uh, so far, I don't see any hands, but uh, you still have the time. Yeah, I, I guess uh, uh, there are no more uh, questions and comments. Therefore, from my side, uh, I would like to thank a lot to all panelists uh, for your great in interventions, as well as for very good questions received. And for, uh, but I, I still see a hand from uh, Levin, Leon and Ivan. Is it the old hand? So... No, it's, just, I, it's, it's the applause. It's the okay. applause see. I'm sorry, I'm, I still need to practice. I should do it physical. <laughs> <laughs> my technical understanding of Zoom. Uh, so I guess now we are moving to the conclusions and uh, should I give uh, the floor to Sonia or Eric, you will uh, do this. <laughs> no, no, please, you can do that, Anna. You've already done it, in fact, so no problem, thank you. <laughs> okay, then I'm inviting uh, Ms. Sonia Koppel, the Secretary of the Water uh, Convention to conclude uh, this session. Thank you very much. Um, um, I would like to thank very much all the speakers for their very interesting uh, intervention and experience sharing, as well as the organizers for putting this all uh, together, INBO, um, ICPDR, and um, 
and other involved colleagues, including the organizer of this whole conference. It's very difficult to summarize everything in a few minutes, but uh, I will try my best. Um, so I think we have seen in this discussion today that climate change is happening. It's happening across Europe and uh, many <laughs> or most actually river basins um, are already affected to different extents with different impacts as it was said at the beginning by, by Timo. So we need to adapt now. And it has also been shown that climate change doesn't know any borders. Um, and therefore basin organizations at national and transboundary level play a crucial role in um, coordinating climate change actions across borders and transboundary basins, um, as it was shown by the ICPDR, the ICPR, the International, International Scale Commission. Um, we have also seen that um, it is necessary to involve different sectors in climate change adaptation, especially, for example, agriculture, farmers, as we've heard, um, but also others such as energy. Um, um, so intersectoral cooperation is uh, very much needed, as well as consultative participatory processes, um, uh, such as the one carried out by the Ardo Garon Water Agency and its Basin Committee. And, um, and also such as the consultative processes carried out in developing the adaptation strategy, for example, for the Danube Basin and others. It, has, it was very nice to hear that nature-based solution and green measures are so important and so much already practiced and implemented uh, in basins um, across Europe, because they are very effective tools for climate change adaptation. Um, and, um, and they are also very much recognized in some of the big strategies, such as the, the new EU adaptation strategy, which was um, introduced earlier today by Veronika Manfredi from the European Commission. So climate change adaptation action helps countries to implement international commitments, um, uh, such as also the Water from the Directive and, and the Water Convention. However, we have also heard about the numerous challenges, uh, existing the numerous needs. And we have seen that uh, um, there um, is still a lot to be done in the coming decades um, um, to uh, really uh, adapt um, and decrease adaptive capacity of our waters. Uh, what is needed is, for example, increasing capacity, improving the cooperation and coordination between different uh, sectors, but also exchanging good practices um, um, across basins. Um, and um, there are several platforms for this, um, um, such as the one here today, but also, for example, the, the global network of basins working on adaptation to climate change, which is jointly managed by the Water Convention Secretariat and INBOM, and which includes um, 17 or 18 basins from around the world sharing experiences and practices on climate change. <laughs> So as Hannah has said at the beginning, the Water Convention uh, together with INBO and other partners indeed uh, helps Basin to adapt to climate change. And um, I would already like to invite you all to the upcoming ninth session of the meeting of the parties of the Water Convention to be held from 29 September to 1st of October, where these topics will also be discussed. Uh, finally, I think we have seen that there is a need to raise the importance of this topic. Um, at the highest political level to mobilize political will and to also show to the policymakers that there is a need for a long term perspective. Um, and here I would like to make a link to global policy processes such as the SDGs um, and the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change and the Paris Agreement. Um, as you all know, the, um, the COP26 of UNFCCC will be held uh, in Glasgow in November this year. And um, resilience is indeed one of the high topics on the agenda at that time, but it is very important to highlight uh, the concrete adaptation actions from the ground and to highlight also there the importance of transboundary and regional cooperation on adaptation. The, um, in these global negotiations, the, um, uh, now is starting a review of the global goal on adaptation under the Paris Agreement um, and um, we need to make sure that water is included is included sufficiently there. 
also in order to to mobilize sufficient funding um, funding for uh, all the different climate change action which were discussed uh, today um, and here again based on organizations um, based on agencies have an important role to play um, and um, with this uh, i would like to um, once again thank everybody the um, uh, inbo icpdr the european center for river restoration all the speakers and um, i would like to uh, uh, wish all of you <laughs> lots of success in implementing and discuss and further developing all the different measures discussed and yeah let's work together to to um, uh, make happen what we have discussed today thank you and i hand back to inbo yes. or to yeah thank you very much for for closing. and I, I will give the floor to philip now for a few words about the next uh, steps and sessions of our European River Symposium. Philip? Yeah, thank you, Eric. And, and once again, congratulations to everybody for a very informative session. I, I, I must say I found it uh, extremely um, useful and, and I'm grateful for all the presentations, but also the, the good dialogue in the chat box that people have used, uh, I think, very effectively. Um, I just want to say that we will start again at, at 2.15, as uh, Ivan Zavatsky, I think, made a, a very good appeal for staying in this session. Um, because at uh, 215 then sharing basin sharing destinies the international river commissions will be in this group so but if you want to join the other session you have to switch um, the link and it should be in the chat the link to uh, how to enhance riparian and floodplain vegetation management that will be starting at 215 so both of those sessions will start at 215 and uh, thank you for your participation and yeah, we look forward to a continued uh, good uh, uh, set of, of events uh, in the next sessions. So thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, bye.